Hello everybody, today we have the pleasure to have a friend, a long time partner and, uh, and a major player also of the Italian American community here, entrepreneurial community in Silicon Valley, we have uh, Damian Scavo, uh, CEO of uh, long list of companies, uh, <laughs> but let's start from the last one, the street beat. And uh, just to start a little bit of a introduction and we'll go a little deeper in uh, your activities but um, I had the pleasure to meet with uh, Damian when he first came into Silicon Valley a good uh, decade ago and two or three companies ago in a typical speed of, uh, of Silicon Valley and uh, I was also a happy investor in one of these ventures that sure. then, uh, yeah. then uh, got a axe wave that got acquired by not a company that is uh, is uh, one of the unicorns that is now out there and expecting the right time to go public. So that's been the way that we cross path. Meanwhile, uh, Damien has always surprised me by the amount of uh, uh, creativity and energy and the ability to look uh, further at what is next. And so one company led to another and today is into uh, a slightly different business. And you'll tell us a little bit more about this that graduated not too long ago from Stardex. I mean, in startup time is a long time ago because it's probably nine months ago and raised $10 million. It's now in the, in the typical scaling phase of the next venture that is uh, happening here in, uh, in Silicon Valley. So did I summarize quite, quite Fantastic, okay? as usual. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so tell us about Streepy. Let's start from uh, the today and then maybe we can go back backwards as, uh, as we see fit. Yeah, sure. So. Street Beat is the result of 20 years of experience in, in the market. So I started working in what today we call high frequency trading and algo trading back in 2001. I worked there for 10 years, including creating my own hedge fund and then uh, uh, selling it in 2010. And, uh, and after that, in the company called Axway, which is uh, also the company which uh, mined the seed, was the name of the fund, invested as well. Uh, with some serious interest in profit novels. And uh, we learn a lot about what uh, the hedge funds are doing in the United States because they buy a lot of data, satellite data, credit card data, GPS data, all to try to measure how the economy is going in, in real time. So, for example, in the credit card data, you can see this week how much Starbucks sold compared to the previous week. And uh, you can see the trend and you can decide to buy or sell um, Starbucks shares. And uh, when, I, when I discovered all this as a passionate trader and investor, um, I dreamed about making all this accessible to everybody. So Streetbeat followed that dream, which is making available to everybody data and technology that is only accessible today to the top 1%. So <clears throat> after the non-compete expired with the previous company, I started to work on uh, Streetbeat at the beginning, it was very difficult to get access to this data because the data provider didn't want to give it to the people. They wanted to give only to the hedge fund and they were scared that the hedge fund would retaliate in case they give it to us. But eventually, also thanks to the GameStop saga, there was some favorable sentiment. You're talking came back into last year, yeah, seems last like year. a lifetime ago. But yeah, it's it only one year and a half ago, yeah. So that helped. We convinced them to give us the data and that's how when Street Beat was really born. So, so just mm -hmm. to understand, so the, the data you're talking about is mostly on the usage of credit cards. So the credit the card, um, GPS position of all anonymized, all um, zip code level, okay, mm -hmm. it's not individual data. 
but it give you a lot of real time visibility of what is going on in give, the world. Uh, let us understand how the you know credit card transaction get overlaid with the with the GPS position. Yeah, and there is also more than that. Uh, but yeah, so basically there are. Um, companies that are better correlate and better and easier to measure with the GPS location, for example, theme park, mm -hmm. and companies that are much easier to measure with the credit card like Starbucks, and companies that you need both, okay, mm -hmm. to be very and well accurate. But that's a, just two of the data set. We have more. We have also app usage, which can be useful for video games, can be useful for uh, advertisers, platform like Facebook. And then uh, we also have uh, the Wall Street uh, uh, analyst uh, um, sentiment, which it helps because it can correlate with some of the macro trending for some stock. So right now we're following 1,400 companies. In this okay, way. so it was about so, to ask. So is that not just the, I mean, I guess main, most of them are in the retail business. So yeah, but also the, the transaction, the transaction yeah. matters and so... Uh, covering in real time how these transactions are evolving gives you uh, a front seat into the projected sales, the then any calls that happen typically two or three months in, in yeah. you know, not, backwards. Not only that, but during the quarter, the companies follow the revenue because the, this credit card data now is in the hand of about 30 big hedge funds and about 100 small ones. So because everybody kind of uses this data, you kind of follow the way. Everybody's well. using the same providers for this. No, there are four so. different providers, actually now five, uh, but more or less we come out to the same conclusion. Somebody get there one day earlier, mm -hmm. okay? So the nuances, and somebody's slightly more accurate on some of them. Mm. So uh, with the credit card data, you can follow accurately with ninety nine percent accuracy, approximately about a hundred fifty public company, which are worth probably a couple of trillions dollars mm -hmm. combined. And then, uh, then there are containers data. So there is a, a, a very rich uh, ecosystem. There are even about 5,000 data sets around the world, but actually as usual, only the 2% are really meaningful. And you need to know which one are meaningful. You need to know how to play with it. You need to know how to handle it. So, so is that mostly for the US market or? Is uh, no, it's worthwhile, but we are focused on the US market at the moment. And uh, we launched first a first version that was just a dashboard with the data, mm -hmm. but we quickly realized that people were not able to use it. So we understood very quickly that we need to connect to this data also the execution part and, ask, and make everything very simple so that everybody can use it. So, so you could have done, sorry to interrupt, you could have mm -hmm. done two things. So either do another edge fund, so using the same yeah. data to edge on, a, on the uh, projection of where yeah. the sales would go, uh, or you know, open source to some extent this data yeah. and provide suggestion and the access to to the masses on investment opportunities. Yeah. Uh, Several companies did that path. Uh, we also experienced with some a proprietary edge fund, and we also considered B, going B to B, but it was very difficult to get the reselling rights on that data. So we couldn't never be at that time. Instead, we managed to get the retail rights on. Well, Post-process of that data, so that's why um, when we obtained that, we were sure that we could um, we could make street beat. And so when we did street beat in November, the first version, it was just the beginning, full of bugs. So we needed to debug it. So we give it to a hundred people in the waiting list to you know play with it. And the and waiting list are are you know high experienced traders or in the waiting list there was a bit of everything. Uh whoever the first people that we give them they were particularly you know active, active. and engaged. And uh, we use November as a debug month and then we did uh, the goal was to reach one thousand users in one year. Okay from November to one November. One thousand clients in one year. But we needed to debug it better and uh, so we ask these people to invite their friends. And the problem is that overnight we got 1,000 people, customers. So, so that, that, was, that was a disaster because we didn't have a customer support. All the things were super buggy. And so we were like them and then they would keep growing mm -hmm. and we let them keep growing for until we reached like 8,000, 10,000. Then there was a lot of fraud at them, people that was creating fake users. So we had to create all those defense. I remember the 24th, 
of December. We were like working like crazy, four days not sleep, the entire team. And, uh, but at the end of December, we cleaned it up and uh, we were able to sustain more growth. At that point, we, we raised a total of five millions, but due to this hyper growth, we asked our existing investor to help mm -hmm. us to, and we did that and we doubled to 10 and we prepared for uh, this year. So let that me, was the beginning. Let me stop there for a second. So how different at that, at that stage were you uh, from a Robin Hood uh, kind of a positioning, right? So opening so, to the masses, the ability at the zero transaction cost, the ability to, uh, to trade. Yeah, so at that stage, the app has only stock, not crypto, and only had one strategy, not the plurality that we had in mind. And the strategy, however, was very active. So the strategy was trading with the user because the user can see. At that time, the user could also modify the strategy. So you were suggesting a strategy that is based heavily mm -hmm. on the data, data that you just managed, or, or people could just uh, trade as they wanted. If they uh, wanted. Exactly. And what was happening is that the people were messing up with the strategy because we let them, mm -hmm. and they were losing money when they mess up and making money when they don't touch it. Okay? Mm -hmm. So we realized that we need to make the strategy even more automatic. However, it was super engaging because every day you would receive like 20 recommendations to trade. And then the problem is that people were overweighted the position wrongly. Okay, And then, uh, but the engagement was to the roof. Volumes where each user, each client was trading 40 times more than an average Robinhood user because the algo trading recommend so many trades. So after that experience, what we did was, wait a second, let's not allow the user to modify the strategy just to subscribe or not subscribe. The engagement was lower, mm -hmm. but the people stopped doing crazy stuff, like wait, putting 100% of the money in a single stop, you should never do that, or, uh, or stuff like that. So. And, 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 sorry, and the business model is to uh, to uh, uh, charge a commission on, on each trade. So the no, the, the trade is free. We uh, charge a manage, management Manage's fee for the strategy that is zero point two percent per month. So the people who were not using the strategy were not charged on that. No, or? they were free. Okay. If Got they it. were trading somewhere else, but because the trade was so many, at the end the people were trading there. And then what happened is that we keep growing so fast that we hit the limit of test flight, because at that time we were still on test flight and uh, Android, uh, Android test. And uh, so we had to quickly, with the Apple helped us a lot to go together, sorry about that. Uh, Apple helped us a lot to get approved quickly and uh, go to market quickly because they were like, what's happening guys? Why you, well, I mean, you shouldn't use test flight to grow 30% per week, you say. And we said, well, like, we didn't know that we got to grow 30%. And so with their help, we managed to migrate to production very quickly. There is a lot of story around those phone calls with Apple Amazing. We'll save it for the off cameras. And then uh, we got there and we had that hyper growth as soon as the app went out of uh, the Tesla. But at that point, we had to stop allowing people to come because we were like 26,000 clients and keep growing. And we couldn't, I mean, we couldn't manage so many clients. So we stopped that. We had to clean some of those users were not high quality. So we have to learn. We have, we managed to put crypto at that point in the strategy. We put DeFi one month later, avoiding all the problems with the Terra Luna because we did due diligence of Terra Luna and didn't check our boxes. And we'll talk about that later. And then, uh, uh, now, on, uh, then we grow, we didn't let people invite us before with a reward that we were putting there. We bring a free and get five bucks. Basically, we turn off all that things. And only this month, for the first time, one week ago, we let again, okay, if you invite a friend, we will get a $3 bonus, three to 3,000, but mm -hmm. the average is six, right. but it's very engaging. And uh, so this week, uh, exactly this week, we went for from 38,000 clients to 67,000 in three days. But this time, the first time when we went, we grow 15,000 clients in two months, we were dying because the team was not ready. This time we grow 30,000 in three days, zero problem. Cool. So that means that we are ready to, to, to scale. scale. And we hit a milestone. So the projection for the end of the months are fantastic because with this milestone of 100,000 in recurrent revenue per month, 
which is huge in a moment in which the market is. Yeah, I was about to yeah. say. <laughs> meanwhile, while yes. you were playing with your app, mm. the market was going bananas, ups yes. and downs. So you started where everybody was uh, super smart. Uh, every every bet was uh, yeah, typically everybody was more a, a, good, a good, return, <laughs> good return. And Warren Buffett, even more if you were trading crypto related into a world where uh, crypto is now, uh, you know, uh, untouchable. And, uh, and the whole market has collapsed and it burned a uh, hundred of billions of dollars right there in value. And mm -hmm. how did that impact your your positioning and, uh, and also the amount of transactions that are happening there? Because yeah. uh, either way, I mean, if there is a management fee, if people are selling or people are buying, it doesn't really matter to you as long mm -hmm. as there are, there are actions. So it, it, the strategies that we designed were long, short, uh, in any case, calibrated for this type of market. So what happened is like, for example, uh, quarter to date, the market, the S&P MIB is down 17%, the NASDAQ 25, the Bitcoin, I think is 60% down quarter to date. Instead, our user are with the DeFi strategy at 2% positive and with the stock trading strategy are only 3% negative. And uh, I think that's part of the reason why we keep growing. Because basically, Streetbeat is like a safe arbor. Actually, it's like a lighthouse. The darkest the hour, the higher the value of Streetbeat. So we are um, anti-cyclical. So the worse the market conditions are, the more we are attractive for the user. Because our steady um, strategies navigate this market to noise much better. And why is mm -hmm. that different from what... Because uh, Robinhood, bear in mind that Robinhood had a, had a huge peak and probably as part of the uh, you know reassessment of market values at a, at a long you know now it's been you know trading trading south for quite quite some time I guess it was also as part of a, a different maturity of uh, companies and what the market now is, is discounting of an over yeah. hyper growth that, that happened that for early stage startup obviously that uh, that you feel less of that. Is that is that part of that or is so, also strategy is different? Yeah, the problem is that Robinhood is all self-direct. So they use the clients of Robinhood lost $35 billion in Q1 out of the 90 that they put in Robinhood, which is a lot of money. Both 90 that was inside Robinhood, so to share Robinhood, incredible growth, the AUM, but $35 billion lost in one single quarter by all these 20 million users. And the, so that's the problem that has Robin on self-direct stock trading is totally cyclical. So it follow the cycle. So the market go up, they gain volume, revenue. The market go down, they lose volumes, they lose revenue because just, they use it. Just a market. subset of the, of the whole yeah, overall exactly. market. Exactly. Uh, and the uh, statistics show that uh, mm, self-direct traders lose more money than their market. Okay. Before many reasons. Why is that they need to pay the BIDA spread? Which in the case of Robinhood, you always pay it because by default it's market order, so you always pay it. And the BIDA spread, for example, in the morning, when you shouldn't trade, it can be like two, three percent basis point. No, two, three percent spread. So these people mm, doesn't they don't know it. So they actually lose a lot of money that they could avoid if they just knew, for example, how to send them mid price limit um, order instead the, the default swipe up market order okay so that's the problem that the product and in general the brokers have and the business model is based on the user trading a lot versus hey we need users that make money when they invest they not just trade with the street bit approach we instead make money by keeping the money and making it grow. That's why our AUM grow 400% from January to right now, actually 500% now after the growth this week. And uh, instead the AUM of Coinbase, Robinhood, all these intermediary dropped dramatically now. So um, that's uh, some of our big differences. Also, do you know out of these, uh, you say 60 plus thousand uh, users, what, what is your typical persona today that is using the, the most? So we noticed that uh, the most active users are the users that are making more than 50K per year as a salary. Mm -hmm. So we noticed that the people that make more than $50,000 per year as a salary have more savings, of course. And so because of that, they are more engaged with those savings. If the people are not making enough money, they, they 
you, they cannot save anything and trade. Wait, so, in the US, I don't know what is the official yeah, poverty, a, poverty line, but it must be around there. Right? So yeah, the, it's, uh, uh, it's actually half of the US population make about half. The median salary, not the average, the median salary in America is about 50K. So You're talking salary now. Here. Uh, talking income, um, annual, individual annual income. So about half of the US population make that money or more. Okay, so that user base is very engaged. The people that is below that uh, threshold at the moment we see in the app, they are li little or no engaged. They probably shouldn't shouldn't trade unless uh, they know what they're doing because no, if, you're, if you're over over spreading, you know your your savings, yeah. clearly you're not doing the right thing with no. a very very um, uh, you know dangerous uh, dangerous uh, procedure. Yeah. Uh, so it's yeah. a special week this part for Streetbit because. We handle a 70% grow over a week with zero problem. And yeah, very comfortable yeah, yeah, speaking you, with you. Look very quiet, very, uh, very relaxed. Comfortable, relaxed. Yeah. <laughs> Compared to December when I saw you. Uh, yeah, you that was a nightmare. So. Yeah. Um, it was beautiful. I mean, I, I'm glad to hear that uh, those things, uh, even in a, in a market turmoil like now, actually turn into, uh, into uh, a better, a safer harbor that as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about a crypto and the DeFi in general, uh, the fact that you added lately this, um, the possibility of, uh, I, can you trade crypto or what? what yes, what now you can trade that? crypto uh, manually. We also have a crypto trading strategy that is not public yet. And uh, because it's difficult, because it includes shorting crypto and there is compliance and regulation that are not ready for, for that. So we are working with our lawyers and our compliance team. We have a huge legal and compliance team to make it in America easy for us to let people have long, short position on crypto, not only long. And I think in this particular market, it's important to be able to uh, handle that. And then we have the DeFi, but on DeFi, we focus only on, uh, because the mar we predicted the m this market volatility, we focus only on stable coin and we did uh, that. Uh, let's do a few, mm -hmm. sorry, a few yeah. definition here. So what's DeFi mm -hmm. is uh, um, decentralized finance. So give uh, us right. a little bit more of uh, what that means and, and then we can move it to the stable coin. Sure. So on top of uh, the crypto movement, there was a new movement that was it, is born, which is how to use all this technology to create distributed uh, financial um, initiatives and uh, they can be dif very different types but the one that uh, got much more attention is the possibility to use crypto although their assets to generate a yield okay and this can happen by borrowing your assets by uh, staking them in certain in certain chain staking means uh, holding them in a certain way connected uh, to certain protocols. In a way that is decentralized by definition yes. because it's in a blockchain. All decentralized, so there is no uh, often a central authority that manages all this, with the pro and the minus of uh, not having a central authority. The minus is what we saw with Terra Luna, because there is no control, an unsustainable project can not only burn alive <laughs> And uh, hurt a lot of people, but can have ripple effects in the interior. Which we're still seeing we're now. Still, right? so yes, a lot totally. of markets are, are you know, turned totally off. Absolutely. And so with the crash of uh, the Terra Luna protocol in April, which we predicted actually in February, to be, to be honest, that's why we never give it to our users. We, w we created a waiting list to see what was the demand. The demand was huge, of course. But we never let anybody out of the waiting list, even if we had the, everything ready, because it was not sustainable. And that's also one of the advantages of having an entity like Streetbit do due diligence on things for you. So you don't need to read online or blog. Or that. You can, you have people that by what, by, I mean, day and night try to understand what's going on and try to get the, only the best for the So customer. for you, is there having some analysts that decide that come, I mean, it will be traded and that is not, uh, in the case of the DeFi, our interest to do. Yeah, to in, the the, in the case of the DeFi protocol, yes. So we do a due diligence of each of them. And uh, so what we, we decided is because the market was so unstable and, and in our sentiment was bare, to use only stable coins. A stable coin is a coin that in, 
in our definition, not only need to be paid, uh, pegged to another uh, real world co uh, mm, coin like the dollar, but it need to, in our definition, it need to be also be 100% collateralized. Okay, which for example, Terra Luna was not. So when in collateralized means that for each dollar in circulation of this stablecoin, they need to be in, a, in an Somewhere. account one dollar in a fiat equivalent in fiat or fiat equivalent that can be I don't know U.S. Gold. bonds. Yeah. No gold, no gold is, has volatility as well. So the, when they are one to one, then we can uh, we started to look at them. And the the best one that we found in our opinion was Circle, which we are very bullish with them, and they recently also released the. Eurocoin, which we think will be amazing. And the reason why we think uh, stablecoin uh, are very powerful is that they immediately remove all the problems related to transfer of assets. Right now to wire money from and to, it, for example, Italy to United States or vice versa, it's complicated, it's expensive. Costly and it's it takes time and if the amount is high, it triggers yeah. so many yeah. extra layers of control that yeah. make it take weeks to clear. With, I, I had an investor that was American, but living in uh, Sweden, and he wanted to invest half a million dollars. And, uh, and I said, well, look, we have a crypto account. Uh, just, this is the wallet. Just, if you have crypto, transfer crypto. We received the money before the email of the guy that was telling us that he sent the money. Okay. I had another investor in Italy, which is an original investor also from Axe, that wanted to put more or less the same amount, it took us weeks because we have to provide all the possible documents to tell them that I exist, he exists, mm -hmm. that the transaction will It's there with the stable that was in direct. The, direct. Yeah, there is pros and cons, right? Of because course. some of that is, uh, I mean, the fact that, uh, you know, Terra and Luna collapse is also due to the fact it was totally unregulated. Totally. So some of those regulation make sense to, yeah. in the interest of, of investors. Okay. Yes. And uh, so I think the regulator will uh, actually do very well for the market because I think that the more regulation that makes sense, of course, we will have the more trust there will be in the, that type of ecosystem and the most adoption. Which is probably a good, uh, a positive outcome of all the cleaning that is happening this yeah. month, right? It was way too much excitement and yes. people were, were investing left and right into uh, features that were not sustainable by yeah. far, and now a good chunk of that is being uh, is being discounted. Yeah, and on top of the these um, stable coins, then there is this extra layer of DeFi projects or stable coin that integrate DeFi project in one single coin, which I think are the future. So basically, with these uh, cryptos, you have like uh, a one-to-one -one pair with the dollar, but the dollar that the crypto is then used for stacking and yielding, like for example, in our case, Sperax, which is a protocol that we support. So basically you have the money one-to-one -one backed, however, it generates a yield in stacking and, and stacking and borrowing automatically for you. So what, it's, what, which kind of yield are you talking it's about? Really, we are in the 11%, which is significant. And these are the commissions that the exchange, the banks, the transfers are taking right now, but in, in, in a decentralized protocol, they are all storage in, in, by the organization and then distributed with this mechanism. So basically that 11% is the money that banks and exchanges were making before. Yeah, so before. With, with all the fees, it seems like yeah. a quite, quite a lot. Of, uh, oh yeah, it's even more. Three actually. times of what uh, people expect. Yeah, it's even more. And uh, of course the bank keep most of it and then pass 0.5 to the to the final Consumers, consumer, yeah. but if you put all together the visa, the credit cards, I mean, the, the wires, the Monty Free, yeah, blah, blah, all the accounts, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's more than 11%. So that's with the decentralized can be redistributed by the holders. So I think it's very interesting. In the next 10 to 20 years, I would say there will be a lot of adoption and moving toward this kind of... Yeah, so it's not, it's not very hard to do prediction now, particularly in a, in a bear market and what everything, you know, around us, it seems to be collapsing, at least uh, in Silicon Valley, at the, with the, some significant, uh, you know, graveyards that mm -hmm. you see around. But how do you see 
your world of reference progressing in the next uh, year or so, regardless of uh, what the you know the inflation or or the macroeconomical uh, trends will be? Uh, it's difficult to do predictions, uh, of course, because of the uncertainty. But if you see the history uh, of these cycles, I think we are halfway. Right halfway now. to what? To, to the bottom. They will be there will be bunches across the road. But the, the thing is that the speed with which we change direction historically mm -hmm. and we recover from this change of direction is shrinking. So basically the um, the movements are more vertical, yeah, but also the bunch back. Yeah, it's everything accelerated. Mm -hmm. So a crisis that would have last like three, four, five years, yeah. now it zipped into yeah. a sure. short, shorter time. Yeah, so. I, I meant in, in particular when I'm thinking of prediction in the use of uh, of the stable coins or DeFi in general, ah, yes. which mm. is a subset of that, and now it's uh, all over the place. I think uh, we're going to start to see companies like uh, Visa, Mastercard, PayPal, and others switch to blockchain because it's better. On, on, under any any parameter yeah, that you look at, it, it just, is technologically just better, is better than whatever we are doing right now. I then see what we call today NFT to evolve into a smart form of contract in combination with the Bitcoins, with the stable coins and the, and the crypto in general like Bitcoins, evolve into a, a smart contract that can be used to deal with invoices, mm -hmm. factoring, buying or selling a cinema ticket uh, and uh, a concert ticket and so on. So right now we have this digital asset uh, painting or gift uh, or but uh, that's yeah, just now they're all yeah, kind of evaporated. Also, yes. Yeah, and but the evolution of that technology in the real world, it's for in my opinion a clean up of everything that is today happening via email. Mm -hmm. like sending an invoice, getting mm -hmm. paid for an invoice from a bank account. I think all this will disappear in the next Hopefully. 15 years and you will issue the NFT and you will get the payment to the NFT. What today we call NFT, you will change name, of course. But what today we call NFT will be the next invoice and the next uh, receipt and so on. Yeah, you know? agree. And payment yeah. will be through uh, the centralized That's exchange true. like uh, uh, using blockchain. That's uh, Cool. Uh, in the last five minutes, I want to pick your brain a little bit more on your path as an entrepreneur, in particular as an international entrepreneur, born, born in Argentina, then back to Italy, and then came probably here, what, 10 years ago now? Ten years ago now. Something mm -hmm. like that. Um, the world has changed in these 10 years. As you said, I am with you that these cycles are much more vertical, in particular when it comes as an entrepreneur. So your world of reference is... Uh, either you know too much fat or or too little mm -hmm. it's hard to be in the middle um what what has been as a, a suggestion for other international entrepreneurs that might want to consider again you know what's the position of uh, being in silicon valley what's the advantage to them being in silicon valley i will start with uh, what have been the tough times that you've had in in reorganizing uh, also, your your profession as a, as one of many entrepreneurs uh, that in Silicon Valley. What, what has been the tough times? Okay, so interesting uh, question. This one, mm, I will say, um, we divide the, the question in two groups. The first one is, what's the uh, what change in this world compared to when I moved here in terms of being here, not being here, etc. And the second part is what was the most difficult moment across okay. this thing. So the, the, the first part of the question is, I think today it never matters less, like where you are operating uh, than today. So up to mm, six years ago, five years ago for sure, there was this rule not written anywhere, but the VC would prefer that your office is about two hours away max from the office. That was not written anywhere, but there was a strong bias versus companies that were abroad. Y Combinator, for example, recently stopped, stopped giving a, a dime about where your company is and work, um, work another, look at other metrics. And with the uh, remote culture of um, that was normalized by the pandemic, by the pandemic Today, where you are really, really impact much less than ever. It's still impactful, but much less than ever. 
I do still think that the mindset of a network or an area, like the one in the Bay Area, it's super important. And so if you try to do a startup in a country that is culturally not supportive of startup, etc., you will have a harder time to find talent, to find investor, etc. So I still think that it's super important to be surrounded and connected with the right mindset. However, how do you do that in a moment in which people don't meet in person, only meet remotely, right? So in those situations, it's really important to foster those relationships that are in the right culture fit for, uh, for you. So to compensate being or not being here and meeting or not meeting in person, they really need to do an extra effort to try to connect and get introduced and uh, to people that have the mindset that you think it's useful or achieve your goal. So somebody okay. that is today as a, at that stage of development where, you know, there is a good idea and a good group of a, a core core team, would you, and is in Argentina, Brazil, or in Italy, would you still suggest to come to Silicon Valley to... I, uh, I don't I mean, think... Yes, at what moment? I don't think is necessary anymore. What is necessary is try to get into Y Combinator or StarTex or an accelerator or or a program or a scale-up program like outside. Validation, getting some sort of validation. Validation and format. networking. Mm -hmm. So these entities then that when you gain their trust, they trust you and uh, they introduce you to other people that are meaningful through this type of meaningful, validated and vetted and due diligence, because there are due diligence processes in place, you can access again uh, those networks that are very important for the to reach whatever goal you want. And then you come here one, one every three months, one every, mm -hmm. to meet eventually in person at the right moment under the right condition, because it's, it's clear this pandemic is not going away anytime soon. So we need to move in the, in the law of the, of the waves and stay safe on the peak of the wave. We are again in a peak, by the way, in case you didn't realize. And, uh, and so you need to play in this way and you can stay at home, just travel occasionally. But it's very important to connect and be validated with the network. But I can say that you have decided to stay here. You have a hacker house in uh, Arthur ah, yes. the Mello, mm -hmm. so you're not doing this. Yeah, the, for me it's different because now I have kids and married. And so for me it was more of a decision related to... Uh, and, my, and by the way, my wife worked work in biotech. So this is the... Instead biotech, you need to be to the office. Okay, there is, <laughs> there is a lab. Yeah. The, oh, until they remote... Uh, completely managed to remote a lab. So... And, La and the Bay Area is the best place for biotech. The second one was related to, I, I will really like the culture and I feel that I have a nice cultural fit here. And I would like my kids to grow up in, a camp, in this place where you are exposed to 30, 40, 50, 60 different culture in a classroom of 15 kids, mm -hmm. you know, which is, I think it's precious. So I don't know where they were going to do with the university, maybe London, I don't, but I like this culture here in the Bay Area. You pay a premium to do this because rent are still pretty expensive, especially after COVID in the suburbs. Uh, but I think it's worth for the kids to have this international worldwide mindset because in the class of my son, really there are 34 states represented by 16 kids. Mm -hmm. so, sorry, countries. Countries, countries, countries. countries, not states. 34 sta uh, countries and 12 states in the same classroom of 16 kids, including yeah. my son, which is born in America by an Italian Argentinian father and a Polish mother, you know? So these things in-, in So outside, he, bring, he brings three just by himself. Yeah, he just <laughs> brings 10% of the poor. <laughs> of the by himself. So that's the reason. And the most difficult thing for me as an entrepreneur moving here. So I, I think they were two very, thing, very, very difficult things. At the beginning, nobody knows you. So there is the chicken and egg problem, which is you need to prove to be validated and to prove you need to have enough to prove, you know, and to have enough to prove it can be a chicken and egg if you have nothing and it's very difficult to prove something, you know. So the chicken and egg problem at the beginning was broken by, by the fact that I managed to arrive here, that I had something that was not yet started. But when I started, immediately we saw the results. No? So that was the first, uh, and support, because I had investors before even coming here, and support that helped me to prove 
that uh, we were serious about what we were doing, and then and capable. And then, uh, and so that chicken and egg problem at the beginning is very important, but uh, uh, it's mitigated by the sense of community that the Bay Area has, because you met people that always ask you the same question at the beginning, which is, how can, can I help you? Yeah. <laughs> what can I do for you? How can I help you? Like, everybody do that, and everybody for real, then help you, to introduce you to other people. And this is pretty unique. I didn't find this everywhere. So this is mitigated by this. The second thing is, in any case, emigrating a new country is difficult, especially for a family with, or without kids. But so I think the difficult challenge was emigrate to a new country, run a business, and have a family at the same time. I do not recommend that. <laughs> so if you migrate to a new country, start as an employee first, settle down for a couple of years, and then start your own company. Especially if in the meanwhile, yeah. you are going through uh, the biggest uh, pandemic. Yeah, the for example, maybe, if there is a so, pandemic yeah. or a financial crisis. Or, Just in case. Yeah. And, and so I recommend to move, if you have a family, I recommend to move first as an employee of a company. Yeah. And then after two years that everything is settled, start your own company, maybe when you have money apart. If you are alone, then it's fine. It's You can take more risk. Well, if you are 24, mm -hmm. it's okay. 22, it's okay. But if not, it's really difficult to make and to keep everything balanced. So I would suggest be careful with that because it's, it's heavy on, on you. And then you cannot focus very well at work or not very well at home. So that was the most difficult. It took me like two years to settle down when we yeah. moved. And we're not so, even talking about the yeah. uh, the visas. That's uh, another... Oh yeah, another, and then the know, visa, the working of, permit, of the nightmares, uh, yeah. And, uh, yeah. which yeah, is totally yeah. a nightmare. And I think there is strong possibility for improvement in the US sure. government. Yeah. For the visa, for example, <laughs> The turnaround instead to be three years should be three hours, you know, yeah. because the same turnaround, the same process in time, it's just that those three hours are spread over three years. Yeah, especially and because if you're bringing potential jobs for a lot yeah. of local people, uh, what's it for? Yes, we're yes. totally there. <laughs> Damien's Cabo. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.